Welcome everyone to today's webinar, Maximizing Founder Wealth Creation Through Effective Tax and Corporate Finance Strategies. Just as a note, we are recording today's webinar and you, we will be able to provide the slide deck as well. Um, and you'll be able to get all of that in your inboxes within the next 48 hours. Now, before I hand it off to our awesome presenters, there are a few housekeeping items I want to address. The first thing being, if you are joining us here for CPE today, we want to make sure that you're actively responding to all of the polling questions and staying on for the duration of the broadcast. We definitely do encourage that you ask questions um, via the chat or the Q&A function in your Zoom toolbar. And today's learning objectives are to review tax optimization, identify corporate finance strategies, and discuss solution fundamentals. And with that, I'm going to go ahead and hand it off. Hello, welcome everyone. Thanks for joining us today. Uh, first, we're going to talk for one moment about the firm. I know many of you are familiar, but Armanino is the largest, uh, 21st largest CPA and consulting firm in the country. Um, we feel that we are the right size uh, firm in that we have the talent and breadth of services of the big four, but we are collaborative, um, we care, and uh, that is um, exemplified in our very high NPS or net promoter score, which is um, more than double the uh, average accounting firm. So uh, with that said, you can see the stats here on where we are and kind of what we do, um, and we'll just uh, move on from there. Uh, here's our team for today's call. I'm going to introduce myself and then ask the others to introduce themselves. My name is Andrea Mannering. I'm a senior manager in uh, consulting. I started my career at KPMG on the audit side. I'm a CPA. I currently manage our strategic finance outsourcing practice, or SFO as we call it, and we provide corporate FP&A for our clients. Uh, Tom is a tax partner. Tom, could you introduce yourself? Sure. Hi, thanks. Uh, it's Tom Bondi. Uh, I started my career in technology, working for a technology company, Semiconductor, and then I've been in public accounting for more than four decades, so been around a while. Uh, having been a co-founder of a couple of dozen software companies, I have a lot of empathy for colleagues and CFOs out there, so I'm happy to help out um, throughout this uh, structure today and anywhere we can be of help. And I am a tax partner. Thanks, Tom. You Ting. All right, Yu Ting Wang, tax partner here in Basin, San Jose. I work with Tom for 20 plus years, and that's how long I've been in this career. Oh, my career is tax. Um, my main focus area is closely held business and um, high net worth individual. I am sp specialized in helping closely held business and um, their funders to create income tax compliance and income tax planning strategies. That is all I have. <laughs> Thanks, Yu Tim. John? Uh, John Kogan here. I'm a director in the consulting organization. I lead our strategic finance outsourcing practice. Um, many decade and many times CFO, CEO, and company founder. Thank you, John. Okay. Uh, here's our agenda for today. I'm not going to read this line by line, but there are three broad um, areas of discussion, tax optimization, corporate finance, and a discussion on dilution. Okay, our first uh, polling question. So we can get those CPE credits. Um, what type of entity are you operating? A single member um, limited liability company, an LLC, an S Corp or a C Corp? So if you guys could uh, complete that, that would be great. And um, to let you know, we will also try to weave in your questions uh, throughout the discussion here today or presentation. Um, we might have to leave them for the end, but uh, go ahead and uh, use the chat function or Q&A via Zoom, and we'll get to your questions. If you are a partnership, you can pick the LLC. We do not have partnership listed. Okay, great. Here's our results. Um, most, uh, most attendees are uh, with a C-Corp. Thank you. Hey, Yu Ting. 
All right. Thank you, Andrea. Thank you, everybody. Welcome aboard and thanks for spending the hour with us. We're going to start with um, telling you a little bit about choice of entities. As a founder of the company, you, you probably be really excited about the new ventures you're starting. And the first questions you get asked a lot of time is, hey, what kind of entities you are forming for your new ventures? And because different entity type brings in a different tax consequences, I wanted to give you a high level of what all this means. And many of you might have already known, but just at a very high level, if you form a single member LLC, what does that mean? Single member LLC means this is an entity 100% owned by an, another entity. And that entity, the parent entity could be a corporation, a partnership, or an individual. So for federal tax purposes, if you have a single member LLC, that means that single member LLC is disregarded for federal tax purposes. All the activities of the single member LLC will be reported on the parent company's returns. So if the parent is a partnership or a C-Corp or S-Corp, all the activities got folded into that parent entity. And if you are individual, an individual owning that single member LLC, then you got to expect that your 1040 filing will have probably a Schedule C for all the activities. Note that different states have different um, filing requirements for single member LLCs, so you might want to just be careful to take a look at the state filing requirements. Then move on to the LLC taxes partnership. If you are an LLC, that means you have more than one member. And if you have more than one member, you can form partnerships, LLCs, or a pass-through entity. And what does that mean? That means the pass-through entity is the entity that the entity level doesn't pay tax. All the income and um, losses will be passing down to the members or the partners of the entity. So the partners or members will get a Schedule K-1. And from that Schedule K-1, they will report all their incomes on their returns. See corporations, you have two types of corporations, C corporation and S corporations. You can think about C corporation just being a box. Everything happened inside C corporation stays inside that box. And S corporation is a variation from the C corporation in that S corporation does have a pass through feature similar to partnership. So if you wanted to make sure that you can take um, take um, advantage of the loss in the first few years, passing down the loss to your um, individual returns, S Corp might not be the bad choice. But you also wanted to consider, is there any other reasons why you are choosing the entities? Oh, what I showed you or talked to you about is tax reasons and tax consequences of the entities. You might want to consider what the company is going to do and what your future looks like before you make any decision, um, um, what type of entities you wanted to form. You want to add anything, Tom? Uh, yeah, I would. Uh, one of the things I would say is that on the on the uh, single member LLC, sometimes uh, corporations will form single member LLCs in order to do acquisitions of business lines or start other business lines, uh, so they keep some differentiation. And then when you're looking at S versus C. As you Ting pointed out, when you're looking at what's the future hold, uh, often if a company is going to be going down a path of funding, uh, of uh, outsour outside funding, you want to evaluate uh, the type of funding you're going to get because, for example, on S corps and partnerships, there may be loss limitations, and a lot of times you want to keep those losses in the early days preserved so that the entity can take it into the future. Um, and, and when you're looking at the corps, uh, you want to get a really good vision. We'll talk more about this, but you want to get a really good vision on what the ownership dilution is going to be handed to you. And John's going to talk quite a bit about that later on. So we'll get into that in a little bit. So next that. slide. Yep. So next slide. Once we know what kind of entities you wanted to form, the next thing you want to consider is how are you going to capitalize the entity? How are you going to capitalize the company? Yeah, so in this slide here, um, capitalization uh, often when we're doing a variety of looking at companies, you got to really go back to the beginning and say, how did the founders get their shares? Are there vesting schedules? Why are there vesting schedules? Should there be vesting schedules on the founders? And sometimes there should be and sometimes there should not be. Um, and then when you're looking at um, what are you contributing? Is it a, a tax free transfer? Uh, for example, if we focus on C Corporation for the moment and we're doing a, a transfer into the C Corporation, 
um, how are the founders getting their shares of stock uh, and are they documenting it properly so they um, justify that they've got um, basis in the corporation and that that's nailed down for going to the future. Um, then we might have, uh, and we might be transferring IP in, we might be transferring another business in. So you've got to look at if a partner, if a member, I should say, of a corporation is transferring in know-how and another member is transferring in a business, uh, there potentially could be tax issues with the founders. And so you'll look into issues like section 351 that avoid taxable transfers. So you're gonna to wanna to explore that a bit. And even if you're in existence for two or three or four years, you still wanna go back and make sure the capitalization was handled properly. So it doesn't come back to haunt you down the road. I would say if you're going to go down the path of raising money, you want to keep this entity clean. So try to keep personal uh, expenses out of the business or else it's going to uh, have a problem with you when you go down the path of funding or exit. Um, what might a typical corporation formation look like from a stock perspective? Uh, I think John's going to get into that a little bit. Um, uh, and so I'll hold off on on some of the uh, authoriz authorized shares and, and the options and so forth on that. But what I would say is that usually um, the founders are gonna take not all of the authorized, although I have seen people do that and that's kind of silly, but usually you might have authorized and the founders might take anywhere from 60, um, 50, 60% of the authorized at the beginning. So we'll, we'll, see, we'll see some examples that John's gonna go through. The other issue I want to talk about is qualified small business stock. I spent a great deal of time working with companies on this area. And this qualified small business stock, for those who don't know, and specifically CFOs need, should be aware of this, is that when someone, a shareholder, sells shares of stock in a corporation where they have held it for, first off, held it for five years, if the company makes um, uh, qualifies under certain attributes of section 1202, uh, then the individual shareholders potentially may be able to exclude up to $10 million from federal taxation and or depending which state you're in, some states do still allow it. California is not one. Um, or so it's the greater of 10 million or 10 times your investment uh, that the shareholder may be able to exclude. That's a critical issue for every company that we have seen because there's a lot of tender offers going on right now and a lot of M&A transactions. We're seeing a great deal of activity in the qualified small business stock area. As a CFO or founder of companies, you wanna pay special attention to this because it's not just one test. There are a variety of tests and uh, this is a very critical issue for the investors. So you do have to be careful what you tell the shareholders as to whether the company qualifies or not under section 1202, because that potentially would reflect back on the CFO or the company if you're giving tax advice to the shareholder. So in this area, which we can explore uh, more if people would like to, you're gonna wanna pay special attention is, is the company making certain qualifications. And just so that you're aware, you cannot be an S corporation uh, you must be a C corporation for the shareholders to begin to qualify for this. So if you're not currently a C corporation or if you were not currently a C corporation when you founded the company, then there should be some discussion for you as to whether your founder's shares will qualify. What other tax considerations should founders be aware of? You wanna pay special attention to if there's any timing where there's gonna be any redemptions because it could affect other shareholders on the qualified small business stock area. Uh, additionally, if you're uh, not a C corporation, then some of the other tax considerations you're going to want to pay attention to are, do you have filing requirements in other states if the company has filing requirements in other states? You take so, anything else you want to comment on this page? No, the only other thing I would add is a lot of time you hear people forming partnerships and two, two partners putting um, cash or IP, the other partners, I'm going to contribute services. In that case, you want it to be really sure that the, um, the partner who contributes services is aware of maybe he has consequences for income picking up at the formation time. So it will be always good to consult with your tax advisor before you form the company and for capitalization of the company. Mm -hmm. Let's move on to the next topic. I do want to touch on the um, executive com and the possible exe um, exit strategies before we go into the finance. 
So Tom, you wanted to talk about um, sure. how does a founder get compensated usually after the company is formed? Yeah, this is a really challenging area because oftentimes founders definitely receive founders shares and then often they don't anticipate when they should start either taking salary or when they should receive additional stock option grants. And these are significant issues. And I've seen companies where the founders didn't take compensation for four, five, six years. And, and yet along the way, they continue to take funding and they're continually getting diluted. And we'll talk more about the dilution. So I would say early stage, it may oftentimes founders won't won't take salaries at least for the first year or two. And the reason for that is because if they go raise any kind of money, um, uh, well, certainly at the founding stage, the founders will often put money in to the company themselves in order to get the company going. And the last thing you want to do is use post-tax dollars that you either loan or contribute to the company only to take out salary and be taxed on it. So that's kind of a silly thing to do. On the other hand, uh, you should build into your budgets and operating plans that once you start getting a certain level of funding, you'll start to um, um, phase in the compensation for founders based on the roles that one will have in the company. Uh, that's an important thing that you get the that you have the operating plan that the investors agree that there's going to be a certain level of compensation as you're going along. You want to pay special attention to did I already have debt on the books? Is that going to be contributed or is that going to be paid out to me. Um, and so uh, again, you might want to phase in your compensation because if you don't, you might run out of dollars too soon and equity is a very expensive proposition if you have to go raise more money. So there's cash compensation. You're going to look at the timing of when you want to have benefits start to come into play. And again, depending on the type of company you have, you may or may not have other types of retirement plans in there. For example, if you're a closely held business, privately held business, and you're never going to raise big dollars, you might start looking at uh, some defined benefit, defined contribution mm -hmm. plans as you start to have revenue. Equity compensation, this is an area that you focus on not only for the executives or founders, but for other people in the company as to the types of options you might want to be giving. Are they going to be incentive stock options, non-qualified stock options? Um, uh, stock grants. Uh, 83B is a is a area where if someone has an option grant and they um, uh, have a vesting schedule, but they wish to exercise their options or their stock grant, they wish to recognize the tax attributes early on so that they have um, uh, the holding period started for the holding of shares, then they would have to file an 83B election on those uh, grants when they exercise or on those uh, stock, I, I'm sorry, the options when they exercise or the stock grants when they receive. And the 83B election must be filed within 30 days of issuance. There is no exception to that 83B, that 30 days. So if the 29th, 30th day fall on a weekend, you better have it done before the 28th and filed because there's no extension beyond that. Again, we can talk more about this if questions start to come in. Anything all around options we can mm -hmm. talk about. Yep. In the exit strategy area, this, this whole area of exit, it's really important for you when you start to, when you look at raising money, it's really important you figure out what your planned exit is going to be because sometimes the path of raising funds uh, is an irreversible path and, and sometimes companies go out of business because they, they, they get to the point where they've, they're down a path of raising money and they just have too much dilution and it's just not fun anymore. So you want to plan out what does this path at exit strategy look like and am I going the right direction? Mm -hmm. There are lots of ways of raising money. There's you know angel investment, there's venture capital, there's strategic, there um, is institutional, there's grants. Companies sometimes forget that they can get grants and sometimes the fastest way to money is revenue. Um, so you want to anticipate if I'm going down this path, what is the implication if, if I'm going to be selling down the road an asset sale versus a stock sale? And that sometimes will have an effect on how you're forming the company or what you're doing with it going forward if you need to spin out a business um, a line. Um, there will be 
down the road in the exit area, if anybody on the call is anticipating the M&A transaction, you do have to anticipate some of the non-compete clauses and the effect that the earnouts or escrows have on an exit strategy. Um, let's see, venture funds. I always look at it this way. A strategic investor is going to give you more money for less equity and a VC group is going to give you less money for more equity. So you want to sort of anticipate what is this ownership dilution? And again, I'm not going to harp on the dilution because I know John's going to get into it and we'll comment more later on. Certainly, if you're going down a path of IPO, which very few companies, of course, are able to do, although with the advent of SPACs right now, we're seeing a great deal of public offerings out there. Um, this, this tends to have an effect on founders and key executives as you're going down this path. And um, there needs to be a great deal of planning when you're looking down the path through the second, third round, funding rounds or, or further even. Um, hopefully that's a little too quick, I know, so I yeah. apologize for that. <laughs> you Ting, you want to comment on anything in there? No, I think we gave people a good like overall life cycle of the entity. So hopefully we're not confusing anybody, but but we wanted to give you a big picture view at, like st at a 3000 high level. So you know, when you get into something, getting into your venture, what do you expect and what? how can we help you to plan for the events coming up? So And, and happy to discuss any of these later on in the in the presentation. So use the chat. We know if you if anything comes up you want us to make sure we we tag on yeah we did get a question tom do you want to answer it now and you ting or do you want to hold off until the end uh, um, let me see let's see i have one question 83b so if i issue founder shares to myself on march 21st i need to file 83b within 30 days that's correct or is 83b applicable to stock options only when they get the stock vested no options 83b comes into play for everybody when you exercise the option so the date begins when you exercise the option of unvested shares so these are 83b so the general guideline is section 83a which says i do not have to report the the uh, tax attributes on either a stock grant or a stock option exercise until the uh, restrictions lap and lapse and the typical restrictions are vesting schedules. 83B basically says, hey, I'm electing to forego the delay in the recognition of tax attributes and I, I will elect to pick them up at this time. Now 83B is good, is able to be utilized for stock option exercises, for stock grants, but not for RSUs. So um, if you have issues on that, uh, restricted stock units, typically we don't see until companies have a lot of cash, they're flush with a lot of cash for a good reason that we could always talk about later, or if it's a public company. So um, this is a complex area, happy to talk about it more uh, later on in the okay, presentation. Yep. Mm -hmm. Okay, so let's move Thanks, on. Tom. Okay, polling question number two here. Uh, how well defined are your KPIs? Uh, not defined, need help. Moderately defined, I know what we are missing. Moderately defined, I don't know what is missing. Uh, well defined, we got this. Um, please go ahead and, and respond to the polling question and I will uh, let you know that uh, Please stay to the end of the webinar. We will be giving something away. Um, not exactly a round of golf, but we do think you'll appreciate it. So um, please stay. How do we do, Marie? Okay. How well defined are your KPIs? Looks like moderately defined. I know what we are missing. Okay, good. Well, that's, that's the winner. Um, a few others there. And uh, this uh, is a, a good way to get us into a discussion on corporate finance. Um, I, uh, I always uh, like to say, and I've been in finance for decades at some of the biggest companies uh, in the world, as well as uh, about a half a dozen uh, startup growth companies that I've been a part of. And I like to say that finance has two primary jobs. Um, one is to help a company understand itself um, you know, how are we doing? Why are we doing how we're doing, um, et cetera. Uh, you can't really control your company unless you understand its economics. So uh, job one is understand those economics. Um, and job two is um, charting a path to your future. Uh, Tom and Yu Ting spoke earlier in the tax uh, area about the importance of having an end in mind. 
Um, of course, it uh, productively drives company structure, um, but uh, financially, we use uh, this tool called the financial forecast, amongst others, uh, that helps you um, actually put dollars and cents next to that plan and get specific around how we're going to get from here to there. <coughs> Pardon me. Um, you really have to use both to succeed. Uh, what we constantly see is um, companies running on the guts of a founder or founding team um, or maybe a key product person. And those guts, uh, by and large, tend to be actually pretty good. Um, but there's just too much going on. It's hard to gut out a multi-year plan from you know, product creation to exit. Um, and that's where finance really comes in. Uh, next slide, please. All right, so um, if finance has two jobs and job one is know thyself, the first part of that is typically reporting. And I've got a little snippet here of a random income statement. And it's got all the stuff that you kind of recognize in a random income statement. Um, and that is, you know, revenue, cost of goods sold, a few operating expenses and, and net earnings. Um, <clears throat> so what have we learned about this company by looking at this? I, I will tell you shockingly little. And um, I think that uh, public companies report like this in many ways um, on purpose. Um, they don't want uh, the competition to uh, you know, get too deep in understanding into their cost bases, overheads, um, you know, how they're running things. Um, and they'll rely on and, and possibly even uh, um, you know, share more data with um, uh, you know, the big investment houses, et cetera. Um, but it, it's no way to run a railroad. If you're running a growth company or close to the folks running a growth company, you want to understand why. And what these numbers are missing is any sense of why. Um, the, you know, momentum from month to month or period to period has no sense of why. Uh, the operating expenses have no sense of why. There's just no why here. Um, so if you have to understand why in order to get better, um, then you need to do better. And that's part of where reporting, financial reporting comes in. Um, <clears throat> we mentioned KPIs in that polling uh, uh, question. Um, key performance indicators are all about the why um, and effective reporting is all about translating that why. <clears throat> so let's go ahead and take a look at a couple of examples of reporting that might give uh, you know, a better sense of um, what's going on, and uh, at least initiate, help initiate a discussion of why. And these are some dashboards that, um, you know, we've uh, used with certain clients, and it, it helps them focus on the things that drive their business and helps answer the whys. Go to the next slide, please. <clears throat> Um, and some of these are relatively straightforward, um, and some of them give, you know, better visibility into, um, you know, operations um, by geography, whereas a lot of companies just de facto report globally, and you can have completely different um, uh, results from geography to geography, you know, that's part of the why. Uh, why is our profitability not where we want it to be? Because North America is, you know, dragging down earnings, or there's a million different whys. These are some examples. Next slide, please. Um, these are a few uh, other ones, and now we're getting into some things like uh, day sales outstanding um, for payments, uh, inbound, and then DPO for outbound payments, um, looking at working capital. We're just digging in here. We're getting into data that leads to a discussion that, um, that leads to understanding and improved performance. Uh, so those who are doing what I refer to as chart of accounts based accounting, um, which is kind of that first page thing, which is just a, a few accounts, which which maybe even probably were established by your first bookkeeper. Um, and you might not have even shaken free of those. Uh, the chart of accounts doesn't get moved very frequently. It rolls up into certain areas, uh, into certain uh, um, uh, parent accounts. And then you're doing all of your reporting based on that and getting none of the why. Um, so uh, that is why we like to talk about uh, financial reporting. We like to um, really understand and every company should understand uh, what their whys are, even if you don't have the answers, what are the questions? Um, you know, what's our profitability per channel? Um, what is our, uh, our DSO and a whole host of other things? Let's keep moving on here. Um, and 
you know, that reporting uh, can lead to analysis. So analysis is, a, is another part of understanding yourself. Um, if, uh, you know, if your reporting um, creates questions about your operations in, in any way, shape or form, then you should analyze um, that. You should always drive for understanding and financial analysis is the way that, you know, the financial world and the corporate world typically uh, tries to get that understanding. Um, and it's you can analyze anything and everything. And I know because I've been in a part of many growth companies that when you're in a growth company, stuff is flying at you a mile a minute. And, um, you know, there's um, uh, oftentimes the instinct is just put your head down and do what you're doing, but harder, you know, more hours. Um, but it, in fact, it really does pay to take a, a partial step back. Um, and try to better understand, you know, why is it so expensive to manufacture our product or uh, why are our consulting margins so low or why is our cost of uh, customer acquisition so high through, you know, these particular online channels. Those are all analyses. Um, so every KPI, uh, we like to say, has an analysis behind it. That's the thing that really helps you understand what drives the numbers. And you don't just analyze for analysis sake. Um, any good analysis always has um, a component of, um, so now what? What are we gonna do differently? How are we gonna get better? Uh, if we could go ahead and um, start looking at a couple of of uh, you know, the areas that uh, we find very common for analysis. Um, I'm not gonna read all of these out, but uh, you know, I'll pick out some high, uh, uh, high level items here. Churn, um, which is uh, the rate at which you lose clients that you've gained. This is especially um, important for SaaS-based businesses, continuing uh, revenue businesses and service businesses. Um, marketing, um, there's just all manner of uh, analysis you can do to better understand your cost of customer acquisition, which helps you understand your fundamental uh, equation, um, which is, you know, long term value of a client uh, minus the cost to acquire. Um, operations, um, you know, their uh, companies vary in complexity, um, but they all tend to have a lot of moving parts. And whether it's uh, server utilization, or cost of goods sold or logistics costs, those are ops areas. And uh, finally, the pure financial. Interestingly, um, these are frequently the least impactful, these financial ones. They, I find they give you the least why. Um, the greatest why is when you're combining operating um, elements with financial elements, like uh, cost of acquisition um, per customer. You know, how many customers did we onboard last month? Uh, what were the sales and marketing programs that led to that? How much did uh, did it cost us on average and per channel and per anything you can imagine to get each of those clients on board? Now you got a whole ton of why and you can start actually taking action. Next slide, please. All right. So we talked about job one, uh, better know thyself. Um, job two is uh, really around forecasting. And honestly, um, that's all about um, understanding where you're going. Uh, so where am I going? How are we going to get there? And forecasting, I like to say, is a, a bit like magic um, because you can actually impact the future without having to live it. Uh, and boy, that's a nice thing. Um, if you can go ahead and just click the next uh, part of the build here. Um, you know, your forecasts will have um, all manner of data. Um, we like to build what we call driver-based forecasts. How many clients buying? How many products and services? At what price? Over what period of time? Um, basically, every revenue, um, cost of goods, and operating um, element to have drivers. Uh, how many human beings do we need to reach this much revenue? Um, you know, how many offices do we need to service our customers? It, it's those are the drivers, um, and the outcome is a roadmap. Um, this cash. Um, uh, graph in the top right is sort of indicative of, um, you know, that's heading in a direction we don't love, uh, which is to say down and probably towards um, our next fundraising or who knows what. <clears throat> but without um, the visibility that something is not working the way we want, or maybe that is part of your grand plan, and you and your investors are going to dump more money in, um, that's great. But you have to understand these things. You cannot run um, on your gut and expect to have um, the kind of favorable outcome that most founders 
uh, and uh, and uh, executives want to have in their companies. Um, so building a, a model is critical, um, and that's uh, you wrap into that all of your understanding of your, your business, all of that job one stuff rolls into job two. Uh, next slide, please. <clears throat> so. Um, Key forecast elements, driver-based uh, revenue and cost <clears throat> components, sorry for the drop to R there. Um, are, are, I explained those a little bit, but that's what makes a forecast make sense. Um, people understand the drivers. We understand that, um, you know, it's going to cost us X to get Y. Um, you know, it costs, we have to open a factory here to serve this many customers or to build this many units. Um, we need this many people in sales to drive this many deals, et cetera, et cetera. Um, it, it's really important not just to be conjuring numbers and dropping them in. Um, they should have a rationale and it should be visible. Um, so, you know, a good forecast model lays out and makes plain all of those drivers so that you can always be revisiting and updating and improving it. Um, Driver-based makes that easy. Um, <clears throat> for OPEX, which is short for operating expenses, there are all sorts of interesting and logical drivers here. Um, and, you know, doing step 1A and 1B will help you understand, um, you know, how your expenses um, are, are built um, and how they help you support the growth of the business. Um, cash, as they say, is king and it really is the lifeblood of any business. Uh, and a great model will, um, oh, actually not even a great model, like the baseline for a model should be resolving to cash. Okay, if you don't know where your cash is going to be, then you're really running your business with uh, at least one eye closed. <clears throat> and you have to understand when you're going to need debt, equity, all those things that uh, Tom and Yu Ting were mentioning earlier. Lots of options, but you have to know, and you have to know well ahead of time. Um, a typical venture equity round will take you six months if things go well from the initial planning to actually getting that wire into your bank. Um, you know, and, and your mileage may vary there, but um, it takes planning. <clears throat> and frequently companies that spend years, you know, planning their next major cash uh, infusion. Um, and you have to hit certain milestones, you know, hey, we're not gonna be able to get that next round of financing unless we hit $10 million of ARR, um, <clears throat> which is annual recurring revenue. Um, you know, all of these things fold together and the very process of building that forecast will teach you an awful lot about your business and how to make it better. It's that magic. Um, just by going through this process, you'll be running a better business. And by the way, you really can't raise a real round of institutional financing nor get significant institutional debt um, without having a solid model um, because they are really interested economically in where you're going because they're hitching themselves to your company. Um, so all of these different elements um, play. And by the way, we like to do uh, sort of seven year models, two years of history. So you have enough, uh, sometimes brand new company, you don't have that history, but then five years into the future because your investors want to see where they're going to come out. Um, you know, investors typically are in for multiple years. Um, they usually figure they're in for three to seven. Uh, and once again, it depends on sort of the, uh, where you are in your life cycle, et cetera. Um, but you've got to give them a fair chunk of visibility. Uh, so John, that John, is forecast. Yeah, on, Tom, of yeah, course. One of the things I want to comment on here is that John was talking about um, a lot of these different metrics and and uh, ways in which to evaluate these companies. Uh, for those of you that are in early stages, you can certainly phase these things in over time as the company begins to grow. But certainly that, that last one of the last couple items there, anticipating the debt that's going to be needed or the funding that's going to be needed will have a huge effect on you in the early stages because as the founders, you're looking at um, significant dilution if you don't map this out and know when the timing is because what you're trying to do is get to the next um, call it valuation metric so that you you don't have to give up as much equity in the future funding rounds and you certainly don't want to run out of debt so yeah there's a runway of cash that you've got to be able to anticipate because sometimes when people say hey my cash that i have is going to last let's say a year and a half well, that doesn't mean at the end of a year and a half, you're out of money. You want to have some resources because it could take, like John said, three to six months to get additional monies. So try to focus also on revenue. Revenues can be a fast way to getting cash in the door. 
Absolutely. Um, and, and, you know, the reason this whole finance section is in a maximizing founder wealth creation um, presentation is because um, we find we work with many, many founders that they're running on that gut. Um, and as I said before, that gut could get you pretty far. Um, but business is just by and large far too complex to do everything by your gut. Um, and then you find yourself in really bad situations. I haven't hit my milestones. I forget setting milestones. You know, I, I don't know what I'm going to be raising this next round on. I'm running out of money. Um, and you have to do all sorts of unpleasant things. So having good finance practices, that is a, uh, a wealth creation tool that um, every well-developed um, company of size pretty much on the planet does. If you look at, at um, you know, any company of note, um, you know, the Cisco's and Google's and Amazon's and, and you know, multi-hundred million dollar companies, they have full finance organizations to go along with their accounting organizations. Why? Because they long ago realized the value of this kind of understanding of yourself and charting a path. Next up, please. <clears throat> Okay, third polling question. Thanks, everyone. Uh, how confident are you in your stock option structure? Not confident, somewhat confident, very confident, don't have stock options. Um, thanks for answering that. Uh, also, just to let you know, um, all of the team members here, uh, welcome. Um, any future reaching out to us? I think we have our contact information on the last slide of this presentation. So you can take a picture of it or just wait until we send you um, the deck in, in a day or two. Okay, Marie, how do we do? Okay, looks like uh, C is our winner, very confident. It's our winner. And then there's another 40% that aren't mm -hmm. quite as confident. And you know what? Yep. Totally normal. <clears throat> um, you know, it, it's almost like corporate structure. Um, you know, these, not everyone has everything figured out up front. And a lot of things can be changed as you go. Uh, some are easier and harder, but um, onward we go. Let's have a chat about cap tables and, uh, and dilution. Um, I'm betting most folks on the call know this piece, um, and I'm going to go through it quickly, just a level set here. Um, a cap table is the um, essentially the database of um, equity at uh, an organization, um, and it can uh, include things like founders' stock, um, investor. Uh, equity, purchased uh, equity, stock options, warrants. Um, there's a, a host of different um, kinds of equity here in different sort of states of being. Um, and this is the database within which you track um, and frequently report on it. Uh, there are a number of platforms that are available actually for sale for doing this. Um, and sometimes your law firm or another service provider will provide this service for you, or sometimes you're tracking it within Excel. But the idea is understanding everything about your equity, who has what, who might get what, which is, you know, options and warrants. Um, and uh, um, it allows you to understand at any point in time, um, you know, uh, who, who owns and controls your entity um, and who might um, if uh, through the exercise of, of various uh, options, warrants and, and other things. Um, so this is, this is the database. Uh, that's your cap table. Next slide, please. <clears throat> cap tables are frequently reported at a summary level. Um, and breaking things out, you know, in sort of ways that are most important to uh, a trained observer. Um, so things like common shares, um, preferred shares, uh, what's in your stock plan, um, which is typically split into um, at least um, the full, what we call uh, stock option pool, uh, which is all uh, options that could be granted, some of which have been granted and you see under uh, 3A, it's options granted and outstanding. And then 3B is remaining options under the plan um, so that you can understand what kind of dry powder you have for um, you know, future employees, service providers, et cetera. So this gives you a sense of um, who's got what. Uh, you'll see at the bottom, um, fully diluted shares, that's uh, uh, item five there. Um, so that's if all shares were to be counted, including things like um, undistributed options, uh, et cetera. 
Um, so um, there are a number of key KPIs, your investors uh, are really going to care about this. Um, of course, the founders really want to understand this. Um, it can also speak to control, which is a, a many varied thing. It can be control as converted to common, um, as opposed to uh, control um, of different preferred series, et cetera. Um, <clears throat> so this is Acme Inc., which is, as everyone knows, Wild E. Coyote's company. Um, all right. Uh, so that's some basics on cap table. Just wanted to get everyone to hey, the John, same uh, level. Uh, yeah, good, Tom. Good thing to comment on here is while you're looking at this, in this particular example, you're looking at multiple rounds of funding. And while the founders started off in this case with 20 million, please keep in mind that the founders and early stage key people should be receiving ideally some grants along the way so that they don't continuously have dilution. So mm. just thought I'd throw that out. Ideally, yes. <clears throat> um, you always, you know, part of um, being educated about uh, cap tables and, and dilution and all that is so that you actually know to negotiate. Tom just brought up a really key point. If you don't know um, that as you know a, a, a founder, you might be able to ask for additional shares, then you're probably not going to do that and your investors will walk on you. Um, so um, let's go ahead and, and move to the next slide here. All right, so dilution, um, you know, what is that about? What does that mean? Dilution means other folks, um, you know, taking, uh, taking equity when you're the originating founder and let's pretend for a moment there's a single founder, um, you know, all those shares are yours until something else happens. Um, you may have enabled uh, the ability for um, other shares to, you know, sprout up and created additional authorized and things that Tom touched on early on. Um, but at the beginning, you're the 100% owner. Uh, and, um, you know, here's some very simple math. Um, if your entity has a perceived value of uh, $1,000 and you have 100 shares, that's $10 per share. You're going to see that, that triangular uh, math uh, popping up here as we move to our next slide. And we start getting into uh, some real world dilution. So first off, here's something that's a, a little more maybe realistic. Um, folks might not know this, you know, founders get to decide how many founder shares there are and people, different people choose different numbers of shares for different rationale. And you could argue that till you're blue in the face, but let's use a million founder shares in this example. And on day one, and before you've raised any outside funding or, or hired anyone, you've got 100% of the equity. If we can click again here, um, let's say that um, your entity before any uh, third party investment is perceived to be valued at a million dollars um, and perceived to be. It's actually a negotiation that you have with your potential investors and you might get different valuations uh, from different investors. So it always pays to have multiple investors so you can actually have a basis for negotiating uh, and have uh, some different options available to you. But with a million shares outstanding and a, a what we call pre-money valuation of a million dollars, um, your pre-money price per share is $1 per share. So that's easy enough, million, million dollars divided by a million shares. Um, and let's say, that um, that investor who, who uh, agreed upon you with that pre-money valuation says, great, I'll put in a million dollars, uh, sorry, a half million dollars cash. Um, and they do so, and you go through that whole dance. Um, then your post-money valuation is a million five. So the concept here is my company uh, was said to be worth a million dollars. We negotiated that, it's actually down on paper. Um, and uh, on the day that the funding closes, you take that, pre-money valuation and you add the cash. Now your post-money valuation is a million five. Um, so that is, that's your, that's, we call that the post-money. Uh, and um, what we'll see with the next click is, you know, in the process of giving you that half a million dollars, they purchase shares. They purchase shares at a dollar per. So now you have a million and a half shares. As the founder, forgetting Tom's uh, you know, wise advice that you should be negotiating additional founder shares as you go, assume that away for the moment, um, you still have your million shares. Um, but goodness, you just lost, well, lost, you just sold a third of your entity for that half a million dollars. Um, and uh, so now you can see, you know, the ownership still totals 100, but that half a million dollars 
that costs you a lot. Um, and the longer you own and kind of run your company, the more it's clear that that costs you a lot of money. Um, so imagine if you only had to raise $250,000, you'd have given up, you know, half the amount of the company that you gave up. Um, you know, can you, can you survive on, on less? There's all sorts of things you want to optimize to minimize your dilution. Let's go to the next slide. So now add stock options. Um, in many rounds, your investors um, might force you to create what we call a stock option pool so that you have um, stock options available to give to key hires or maybe consultants, et cetera. Um, and they frequently, this is a negotiable item as well, okay, um, uh, depending on your leverage, but sometimes you have to actually eat that stock option dilution yourself before the new investor comes in. So let's click again. You can see we've created a 140,000 option pool that sits on top of your million founder shares. Um, and now even with the same pre-money valuation of a million dollars, the price per share, the value per share is 88 cents. So that dropped. Next click, please. Now let's say they invest the very same um, $500,000. And last up, what we'll see is how all of that math works. Um, they're still adding 500k on top of a million pre, okay? So they still get a third of your company. That's the way the math works. But now once you've carved out the option pool, um, you've only got 58.5%. Uh, so um, that is, that's where your ownership is going. Next slide, please. All right, um, this is what multiple rounds of funding could look like. Of course, every company is different. Their path is different. Uh, but if you're not careful, and even if you are careful, uh, if your company depends on multiple rounds of funding, you're going to find yourself holding a heck of a lot less than 100%. Even the most successful companies on earth founded by rock star uh, founders end up with a lot less equity in general than one might expect. Um, and of course, this is all paper value, um, and I probably don't need to remind anyone what that paper is worth. Um, all right, there we go. That is um, uh, the lesson on, uh, or, or the part of the program on dilution. Let's go ahead and take a look at a quick case study of tax and finance together. Yeah, we're running just a teeny bit behind, so I'm going to sort of go to the end of this, but we thought it would be interesting to give a real-life example of where tax and finance uh, work together to maximize founder wealth in a huge way. This is a, a client uh, of ours um, we started working with this year. Um, when we first met them, they uh, had received an offer that to sell the business. We thought it was low. We, we asked them to give us an opportunity to uh, help tell their story through finance and uh, structure them correctly in tax to maximize wealth. And uh, they are currently going through a due diligence and sale process at two times uh, plus the, that original offer. So we feel really great about that. They're super happy. Um, that's the the end game there. Yeah, and that was an interesting mix of tax and finance. Uh, first off, tax on the structure to save them significant dollars. This was a, a very, very large uh, um, transaction. Uh, and secondly, they were being lowballed up front. And because they didn't have their own forecast, they didn't understand that. Um, they, they had a bit of an inkling. That's what drove them um, to us. And then uh, you know, built a full financial model, looked at the metrics and the multiples, and they're like, aha. Um, okay, and then they went through a slightly fuller process. It only took a handful of months, actually, uh, for the additional work and more than 2x, um, which is just amazing. So and, they were very I, happy I, to do that. John, and I would say that while tax shouldn't drive the ultimate um, uh, decisions, it is helpful for the CFOs and for the finance side of it to understand the um, tax attributes associated with the companies and how that plays out in negotiations in the exit strategy, because many times um, uh, founders or CFOs leave money on the table because they're not yet totally understanding the impact that future tax benefits might have that are built into the company as, uh, uh, already. So um, it does require a joint effort of both finance and tax discussion. Without a doubt. <clears throat> All right, let's keep going. Okay, our last polling question. When was the last time you reviewed your tax strategy? 
was it uh, in January of this year, January 2021? You reviewed it in 2020, reviewed prior to 2020, or never reviewed? Um, we're hope, still hoping, we know we're getting to the end of the hour here, but we're still hoping to be able to do some Q&A at the end of that, end of this. So please uh, uh, write into the, the chat or Zoom Q&A. Okay, uh, never reviewed and then reviewed in 2020. Looks like not as many uh, just recently this year. So thanks everyone. Okay, in summary, um, never too early to have optimize your tax structure. Uh, review your tax strategy every year. Don't run your uh, business by your instincts alone. There's tools out there for you. Reporting, analysis, and forecasting are the foundation of effective finance and um, will get you to your goals faster and with less risk. <clears throat> Okay, where do we go from here? What we're offering to everybody on the call and who gets the reporting uh, recording later is that um, a free tax and finance uh, assessment. So we are going to sit down with you. Um, if you're interested, a lot of information can be exchanged in an hour. If you provide us with your um, existing forecast and recent financial statements, plus last year's uh, last two years tax returns, we can come to the discussion uh, armed with some knowledge and advice and would look forward to uh, to speaking with you. So and even please, if you, whoops, yeah. sorry. And even if you can't come fully armed, we'd still be happy to have the conversation. Yeah. Um, we would just have it with a bit less information. And please do use the experts at armaninollp.com um, to uh, express your interest in that. Okay, um, here's our contact information. Um, as I said, everybody will be receiving the deck um, in a day or two. Uh, do we have any uh, questions, Marie, that we can respond to in our last like three minutes here? Quick question for Tom Bondi. Um, Tom, if, if someone needs to, wants to change corporate structure, um, how doable is that? Well, uh, if you're going from an S or an LLC to a C Corp, it's uh, very doable. If you're going from a C Corp structure to some other structure, um, you've got to be very careful because of built-in gain issues. And um, so if you're not aware of built-in gain issues, you really do want to get some uh, uh, different dialogue going on just the various types of structure. Why are you looking to change it? And what might be the um, financial and tax uh, implications of doing such a structure? This is not one of those situations where you want to change the structure and then and then look for forgiveness later. You want to plan it out in advance. Okay, great. Looks like we did get a question. Um, John, for the last slide on dilution, is that a typical dilution or is it common to have only about 50% ownership after pre-seed round? Um, yeah, it's... Um... Um, I guess I should say your mileage may vary. Um, it very much depends, and it mostly depends on those early rounds at the low valuations, because that's where you're giving up the biggest chunks. Um, I would say it's um, that's a totally normal um, dilution path. Um, I've certainly seen better and I've seen worse, although better and worse is all relative too. Um, because owning 50% of a $2 billion or 15% of a $2 billion company is great. And owning 50% of a $2 million company, while still great, less interesting. Um, so it really depends on what your goals and expectations are. Um, but that's not a typical what I, what I showed there. Okay, thanks, John. Um, Tom and Yu Ting, there's a tax question. Pre-revenue, what are some of the most important tax aspects to keep in mind while developing SaaS IP for a C-Corp? Well, there's some really key benefits you could be looking at, for example, just the whole R&D area. Um, and as you're developing this, what types of benefits can you be generating? For example, if you have five, 10, 15 people or more and you're developing an, a SaaS model, um, or, or any kind of IP for that matter, you could be taking advantage of 
um, R&D credits that can be utilized to obtain refundable uh, employer FICA, which uh, up to 250,000 a year is, is basically free funding that companies uh, tend to uh, ignore. Uh, the other is you wanna start paying attention to uh, the um, deferred revenue model that you're starting to build out for your SaaS. And companies tend to uh, make mistakes in that they, they believe that all of their revenue uh, should be taxed in the home state where they set up. And it's very common for SaaS models as you start to build out to have um, tax reporting requirements for income tax and also for sales and use tax throughout the country. So the problem with attributing, as you start to grow revenues in a SaaS model, the problem with attributing all of your revenue to just one state, say California, is that you may be uh, over-reporting your net operating losses uh, for the state, and you may be under-reporting your requirements to other states. So happy to dig more into that if you wanna have a follow-up discussion. Thank you, Tom, and thanks to everyone for joining us. Uh, we are at 11 o'clock, so um, we'll let you go. Thank you. Thanks, all. Thank you. Bye-bye.